Okay, this video is Lipotoxemia Theory of Nathan Pritikin Revisited. So what's happened is I'm working on another project. I'm actually interested in dementia right at the moment. And I came across this talk. I had previously given a lecture about it. I'll just add a little bit to it right now. Because a lot of people, you know, the same old nonsense. People from the High Fat Phony Club are giving me a fuss about, oh, why don't I support High Fat Phony? And I don't support it because I think it's wrong. All right. And... I just found this lecture and you know people seem interested in it so I'll talk about it. Basically Ansel Keys had shown back in the 1950s and 60s that high fat diets, especially saturated fat, had a strong association with increased incidence of heart disease, coronary artery atherosclerosis. And the low fat countries did not have this problem like the seven country study. And William C. Roberts, the greatest cardiac pathologist who ever lived, said the best data he ever saw for atherosclerosis due to sap fat was coming out of the Ansel Keys seven country study. Okay, so um, we know sap fat is bad. There's nothing ambiguous about it. You know, we could go on and on. There's mountains of data to support that. Peter Kuo did the blood sludge studies back in the 1950s, and then in the 1960s, Meyer Friedman, Ray Rosenman showed that you got even bigger problem with PUFAs when they uh, had the patients ingest that, then looked at their eyes. Roy Swank had similar data. Roy Swank especially thought sap fat was a bigger problem than PUFAs. You know, the earlier guys thought PUFAs were worse. Blankenhorn's data on atherosclerosis, so it doesn't matter what type of fat it is. All types of fat are atherogenic. And the only way you're going to effectively lower lipids is to minimize all types of fat. Okay. Um, back in the old days, 1950s and 60s, Dennis Burkett, Peter Cleave, and you Troll had noticed that the people of England eating a high-fat diet with a lot of simple sugars and low in fiber had a lot of abdominal pressure syndrome. That's because fiber adds water to the stool, the bulk, so when you defecate, it's a cow patty. Instead of a lack of fiber diet like the modern American SAD diet, standard American diet, you defecate, it's like a goat pellet, a Tootsie Roll, dried out logs. Okay, anyways. Uh, Peter Cleave thought the main problem was too much simple sugars leading to elevated blood triglycerides. Elevated blood triglycerides do cause blood sludging, meaning that they're going to lead to hypertension. Okay. Um, and they're, and they're going to be atherogenic. Okay. Uh, Burkett and Troll thought that the main problem was a lack of dietary fiber, and especially for abdominal pressure syndrome. But there's more to these chronic Western patients. Abdominal pressure syndrome is just one group of diseases in the abdomen. But the same lousy diet is associated with hypertension and atherosclerosis. So anyways, Nathan Pritikin was reading all about it, trying to put it all together, reviewed all the literature on high-fat diets, you know, up until around 1980 or so. And he came to the conclusion that basically the Western diet is bad for multiple reasons. Number one, it's high in fat. Number two, it's high in sugar. Number three, it's low in fiber. But the biggest problem by far is it's high in fat. He noticed that countries that eat a high-fat diet have high rates of the chronic Western diseases like obesity, hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery atherosclerosis, impotence, usually thought primarily atherosclerosis, but there's other causes, arthritis, typically DJD, degenerative joint disease, autoimmune diseases, hearing loss, vision loss. He'd also noticed that Walter Kempmer, when he put patients on a very low fat diet, they got better. His diet was also low in sodium and low in protein, okay? Um, he had legendary rates of clinical improvement, reversing coronary artery disease, reversing type 2 diabetes, diabetic hypertensive retinopathy, autoimmune disease is extraordinary. Some congestive heart failure patients. Pretty can also notice that traditional plant eating populations, like for example the Tata Humata, they didn't get these diseases. They were normal weight, had great exercise endurance, no coronary artery disease or hypertension or type 2 diabetes. So Pretty can concluded the number one factor that was making people sick. The biggest toxin in the Western diet, Dr. McDougall agrees with this, is excessive dietary fat. It was the main cause of chronic disease. Okay, and he called this the lipotoxemia theory. Okay, so lipotoxemia theory, he knew that high fat diets cause sludging of the blood. You can also call it Rouleau formation, stack of coins in French. The excess chylomicrons do that. It turns out triglycerides do that, and elevated LDL cholesterol does that. 
Okay, we talked about Peter Quo's experiments. We talked about Ray Rosenman, Meyer Freeman, and Roy Swanks, all showing the same thing, blood sludge from high-fat diets. He was also aware that Otto Warburg, Nobel Prize winner in 1931, a guy from Germany, biochemist, had shown that hypoxia, lack of oxygen, will damage mitochondria. When it gets over about 35% or so, you can have irreversible injuries of the mitochondria, and that is associated with increased rate of cancer. Okay, the cell reverts essentially from being a human cell, a member of uh, an organ, a, a group team player, to becoming like a bacteria, just trying to replicate itself. And you know, pretty can notice the populations that eat high fat diets, they've got high cancer rates. The higher the fat, the more cancer. Now, there are people like T. Colin Campbell who came along later and said, well, gee, you know, when you look at sat fat, that really could be thought of as a surrogate marker for animal protein because animal fat is the main source of sat fat. Okay, so you know, T. Colin Campbell has a point, but still, um, Pritikin was correct. The more fat these people are eating, and it's especially going to be sat fat, the higher the cancer rates. Okay, PUFAs are a disaster too. We'll come back to that though. All right, uh, they have more bile acids, they get more colon anaerobic bacteria, they also have less fiber and they're more prone to leaky gut. It's also been noted that Papua New Guinea, they smoke like chimneys, but very not much lung cancer, over six times less lung cancer than uh, smokers in the Western world. Japan smoked a lot, and they also had less lung cancer. They had about, you know, only half as much lung cancer, and it's thought because they ate a low-fat diet. Okay, but they still were getting a lot of vasoconstriction because they are eating tons of sodium. That's why I think they weren't quite as well off as the Papua New Guinea population. Okay, other diets associated with, other diseases associated with high-fat diet. Gout, uh, DJD, arthritis, degenerative joint disease of the arthritis. It's also called osteoarthritis. It's not just because of obesity. It's also called lack of blood flow, ischemia. And there's more to it than that. Uh, insulin resistance and diabetes. So basically, the main cause of uh, insulin resistance is high-fat diets. If you want to cause diabetes in an animal, feed it a lot of saturated fat. Okay, high-fat diet, we talked about hypertension and all that does. Pritikin also pointed out there's more of the chronic Western type diseases, hypertensive retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma in Western populations, more uh, loss of hearing that's thought due to atherosclerosis. Okay, so Pritikin summarized the three major problems with a high-fat diet in his opinion. Number one, tissue hypoxia. You know that from blood sludge, like Peter Kuo was measuring 15% less oxygen delivery to the tissues. Rice wank and a hamster brain got 30% less oxygen delivered to the tissues. We know the high-fat diets were associated with diabetes, type 2 diabetes. We know the high-fat diets were associated with elevated cholesterol, and that's associated with atherosclerosis. And we know the blood sludge causes hypertension, so those, that right there is the gateway diseases. Hypertension and diabetes are the gateway diseases to causing atherosclerosis. And then atherosclerosis plugs up artery all over the body, causing tissue damage, okay? So Pritikin's brilliant statement was his lipotoxemia theory saying a high-fat diet is the major cause of obesity, makes people fat. Like Dr. McDougall says, the fat you eat, the fat you wear, the higher the percentage of calories from fat, the fatter the population gets, uh, causes hypertension and diabetes, gateway diseases, atherosclerosis, and heart disease, coronary heart disease leading to you know, heart attacks, leading to atrial fibrillation, leading to congestive heart failure, arthritis, especially DJD is by far the most common cause of arthritis, same thing as osteoarthritis, but also increased risk of autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, vision loss, hearing loss, senility, and by that he means dementia and also cancer. Okay, so now, you know, we've got a lot more information available to us than Nathan Pritikin had back in 1980, and we know that it damages blood flow for additional reasons. We know that leaky gut leads to bacterial endotoxins getting in the blood, causing um, amyloid clotting of the fibrinogen protein, the clotting protein in the blood, so we get amyloid clots, that's bad. We know that it damages the endothelial lining, causing collapse of the glycocalyx, and thus, exposure of the vascular cell adhesion molecules that are prothrombotic on the wall of arteries. We know high-fat diets cause increased permeability not only of the gut barrier but of the blood-brain barrier leading to some neuroinflammation. The bacterial endotoxins that get through to the gut have some increased access to the brain and that can activate microglia and cause other problems. Okay, and then you also, when you get insulin resistance, you have higher insulin pumped out by the pancreas 
and then insulin degrading enzyme has higher affinity for that than it does for beta amyloid protein, so it can't clear out all the beta amyloid protein. Beta amyloid protein crosses the blood-brain barrier in the opposite direction, goes into the brain, and causes neuroinflammation. I'll talk about that in a future lecture, but what I'm trying to say is Nathan Pritikin was understating the, the, the harms caused by high-fat diets. And I, and I also say this because I, I get pressure from these like high-fat phonies like, oh, why don't you support so-and-so's recommendation of all this fat stuff? And I'm like, yeah, right. I don't support it because it's wrong. Okay, recommendations of Pritikin. He recommended initially that people eat less than 15% of fat. And there are some people who still recommend that. If you look at the guys, and I think they're, they're pretty smart, you know, like Robbie Bittero over at Mastering Diabetes. He's a smart guy. I think he's doing good for his patients. But I also think he's kind of young. I don't know how old he is, but I'm going to guess he's in his 30s. Maybe he's 40 now. I don't know. But he's, you know, a young athletic guy. He used to be a superstar tennis player. What I'm trying to say is the average person's not an athlete. The average person's a couch potato. And they need to get their fat lower than that, I think, for ideal uh, protection against atherosclerosis. Uh, Pretty can eventually move towards wanting their dietary fat to be low, below 10%. He did, at least early on, allow minimal amounts of animal food in his diet. You know, he said it was so they could get some B12. You know, nowadays, of course, you can supplement pretty easily with B12. And McDougall also mentioned that he thought that he did it in part for better social acceptance of his diet. Uh, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, Dr. McDougall, T. Colin Campbell, myself, we all recommend 0% animal foods, none, not a... The only supplement I take is methylcobalamin and B12. So the standard low-fat vegan diet, I guess you could call it the very low-fat vegan diet, is 80-10-10. 80% of calories from carbohydrate, 10% from fat, 10% from protein. Kempner rice diet was in the ballpark of 95.5. It was actually closer to like 92.44. It was super low, super low in fat and super low in protein. He wanted it low protein to protect from uh, damage to the kidneys, and also low-fat help protect against hypertension. Pritikin had recommended a total cholesterol less than 160, but I think he went lower than that eventually. Esselstyn, McDougall, T. Colin Campbell, myself, based on the Framingham study, etc., we like to see total cholesterol below 150. Persons should also avoid simple sugars because they rot your teeth, okay? They'll also cause increased triglycerides, which can cause blood sludge, but, man, when your teeth get messed up, then the dentist puts stuff in there that you don't want. It's bad. Okay, you want to avoid all the processed foods. Uh, let's see, eat your fruits and veggies. Oh, and then the, th the next question arises, what about good fats? And what I'm telling you, there's no good fats. You need a little bit of omega-6, a little bit of omega-3, but you easily get that just from eating plant foods. As Dr. Uh, McDougall said, Nathan Pritikin, there's no such thing as a fat-deficient natural diet. Any type of fat you choose, any type of food you choose, you'll get enough fat. Um, as Nathan Pritikin said, fat is bad. You can't win with fat. Okay, this is just showing the amount of fat in some foods. And basically, the point is that fat's really low in the vast majority of plant foods. There's a couple exceptions to that. Soybeans are too fat. They're like 40% of calories from fat. Nuts are terrible. They're like 80 to 90% of calories from fat. Flax is about 60% of calories from fat. Oil are 100% fat, liquid fat. So you want to avoid all those things. You'll get enough protein. It's impossible to be too low in protein. This was just showing omega-3. There's a surprisingly good amount of omega-3 just in eating you know, regular plant foods, so you don't need to go search it out. You'll get enough. Supplements will often be rancid. I have undergone lipid peroxidation. These are just a whole bunch of uh, uh, references that uh, many of them are ones that uh, pretty can quote it. Some of them are stuff that I added later, but... Um, you know, we talk about Peter Quo's paper on the blood sludge, Friedman's paper on the blood sludge, Swank's paper and book on blood sludge. Uh, McKean and White fed patients uh, chemically controlled diets where there was less than 1% of calories from fat. There was just 0.7% of calories from fat, and it was omega-6 fat, and the patients did fine. The, the, all the cohorts did really well. So the point was it's impossible to be anywhere near that low in fat. Dr. Blankenhorn's study where he showed whatever type of fat people ate it was atherogenic and your only bet to minimize it was um, minimizing dietary lipids, all dietary lipids. Okay, and we know even the so-called, you know, they try to give them a health halo, the omega-3 fats are associated with increased risk of prostate cancer, increased risk of atrial fibrillation, 
and you're going to have increased risk of obesity when you're eating all that fat, which is going to lead to secondary problems. Okay, um, Brasky, yeah, showed that omega-3s are associated with increased risk of uh, prostate cancer. And this was a paper showing omega-3, you know, they suppress the immune system a little bit, and that's thought to be the reason why they're associated with increased risk of metastatic cancer in animal studies. Anyways, I think that's it. I hope you found this helpful.